So open your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 2. To Matthew chapter 2. Uh, my kids will tell you, I mentioned this morning, boy, we love Christmas at our house. We normally have Chris, six Christmas trees set up. We only have one right now in the process of moving a little bit. And, uh, and, I, and I'm not, I, I just got to put this out there. <clears throat> this is not my sermon, but it might as well be. I'm not till Christmas music till after Thanksgiving. Now I could stay there for a little while there. I could preach on this. I could open the Bible, shut the Bible, and shout a little bit, have an invitation. And some of you need to come forward at that time. <laughs> And get right with God. Christmas music, the day after Thanksgiving, that's when it turns on. And, and, uh, and you know, sometimes you got to call sin out where you see it, Brother Ash, right? you, you got to call it out. I, uh, I get home Tuesday night from the praise service. I get home Tuesday night from the praise service, and uh, my family got home first. Pastor, I don't, I, don't even, I don't even know you in this conversation because you're, a, you're like a September Christmas music guy, okay? And we'll be looking for a new well, well, yeah, October, yeah? So, yeah. You pray for best counties, looking for a new place. And <laughs> no, no, but I get home from the praise service, and, and as I pull up, I hear these, this music coming from inside my house. My, my wife, you know, the, the woman that thou gavest me, the Lord gave to me, uh, and, and from inside my house, there's Christmas music coming from inside. And, and they had planned on, so I'd walk in the door, Mrs. Electris, and, they, and they'd, I'd hear it, and they're like, oh, daddy's home, play it louder, oh. And... Uh, <laughs> not right it's not right it's not right but then after Thanksgiving comes boy we turn that music on and we just let that play everywhere and I, I love Christmas love Christmas time the music and all the things and excited about this sermon this morning this evening and about it's about reactions as you this morning um, you know where we're going tonight and in life we have different reactions about lots of things I want you to think about the most exciting day of your life when it was now, most of us live a very, with these kind of questions, a very, um, a very simplistic life. We think very recently. Okay, we think, oh, for some of us, it's a snow day. Some of you kids, that's the most exciting day. You're like, well, you wake up and you turn the TV and you think, wow, Pastor Howell's not the Grinch that he thought he was. There is 14 feet of snow and we're not going to have school today. Praise the Lord. Exciting day. Wedding day is an exciting day, is it not? Oh, I didn't get a lot of amens. <laughs> May have to have a wedding sir, a, a seminar. We do every year. It's called the Couples Retreat. Some of you ought not to go on that thing. And um, boy, the wedding day and, and your, you know, your bride is beautiful. In fact, we're talking about the wedding day uh, just the other day with Miss Caitlin and talking about Pastor Ryan about his wedding day. And uh, we had the opportunity to be down there. He took some of those pictures and shared this in Sunday school this morning. And, and um, we're sharing the fact that at Pastor Ryan's wedding, he... He, he, he not only cried the whole wedding, he bawled the whole wedding. I mean, just, I mean, tears flowing the whole thing. Now, we've had the privilege, privilege to take a lot of pictures at weddings. And a question we've often gotten at weddings, um, going into a wedding from, from these brides, is they, they're like, well, will you capture, um, you know, my fiancé, the groom, as I come down the aisle and he cries? Will you have someone shooting those pictures? I try to carefully break it to the, to, to the bride that, that not every man cries on his wedding day. Some do, and, and some don't. And, and some of them have the idea that they saw this on a Hallmark movie one time, and that's what they're expecting is going to happen. And uh, I, I told my wife, you know, now I said, I'm not going to cry. She looks so beautiful, I don't cry when I see her looking beautiful. That's not my reaction. Like, you're beautiful. Oh, I can't handle, handle it. Well, <laughs> Pastor Ryan bawled the entire wedding. In fact, well, you told me there was a couple guys in your wedding who didn't cry at their own wedding, but cried at your wedding because you were crying. And I had to break it to Pastor Ryan. I did not cry at my wedding nor his wedding. Okay, neither, neither one. I told this, the class, the young couples this morning, if you get a moment, if you weren't there, I'm going to ask them about their kiss at their wedding. It's worth the story. It's worth the story. I won't tell you now. Um, it's, not, it's not mine to share, but if they don't tell you, I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> but that's an exciting day. I still remember getting married in this auditorium right here, and uh, when Dreen walked down the aisle, it's an exciting day. I remember the day I got saved, six years old, Pensacola, Florida. A few years back, I got, I got to go back to the church, the little place where I got saved. Exciting day. What's an exciting day in your life? I remember when, the, when Johnny was born, first, first child. James and Danielle was a blur. <laughs> Just kidding, baby girl. Exciting day. And I open up this morning, I want to open up the same idea tonight that 
there's always reactions in life. And the wise men reacted to the birth of Jesus Christ. They reacted and, and they did some things that I believe will be a challenge and a help to us. This morning we looked at how they were developed in their study. And they had studied the scriptures and they, and they grabbed some random verses that even if we read today, I don't know that we pack up, jump on a camel, and start a two-year-long journey. But they did. They did. They knew it that well. They believed it that much. We saw this morning also that they were, they were um, devoted in their giving. They were generous. They lavished gifts on the baby Jesus or the young child Jesus. We often see the nativity set and, and you see the Jesus in and, and a manger and Mary and Joseph and a few shepherds and a sheep and a donkey and, and, and a cow. There's always a cow there. And um, then you see the wise men. And we know from the end of this Matthew chapter 2 that they weren't there at the manger. It was a couple years, at least a couple years, a year and a half to three years later they showed up. But this season, this music, these decorations, these lights... Christmas trees are all about a reaction to the birth of Jesus Christ. Right? That is why we're doing this this whole season. All right? It wasn't because of some guy in some German town started to give gifts, and now we have uh, you know, this, this celebration. All right? We are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. And I would challenge us tonight, like this morning, to ask ourselves, how are we reacting to the birth of Jesus? You're like, oh, Brother Howell, I, I've got this nailed down. Listen, um, we, we pray over Christmas, and, and we read the Christmas story, uh, December 25th, and, and that's a wonderful thing, and I think you ought to do that. But if that's all that there is, it would seem that this season would seem, would seem kind of shallow. If all we do is, is put up some lights and read the Christmas story and sing a few carols, then maybe we've missed something greater. I want to finish tonight and look at the story or the account of the wise men from Matthew chapter 2, if you'd allow us to. Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, I point out this morning, I point again tonight, if you weren't here this morning, that's how they knew, that's how we know Jesus was born. The Bible tells us. The Bible's true. Born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, Where is he that is born, king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they'd opened their gifts, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the time we have tonight. I ask that you would meet with us. Lord, this is your word, this is your truth. Lord, help me as I presented that I would present in a way that would honor you, that would be true to your word. Lord, help it to touch our hearts. So the long past, the time we remember what story was told or what night it was, the truth from your word is burned in our heart. Lord, would you help us to examine our hearts in light of your birth, your son's birth, and would you touch us about that subject? In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Well, there's two more particular responses that I want to look at tonight. Um, one, or both, or both you've, you've heard in some way, shape, or form before. The problem with the wise men is that we know so much, yet so little about them. As some historians say their names were, were Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. We don't know that, just what they've said their names possibly were. 
We don't know exactly where they were from. It, it says they were from the east, and based on their gifts, it's po quite possibly Babylon or Persia or in Arabia, somewhere in that area. We know it took them about two years to travel, and there were most likely more than three, all right, though the nativity scenes depict three because of the number of gifts, and there were wise men, so there was at least two of them. Most likely, though, there was a huge caravan of them, most likely. And we don't know a lot about them, but we know a lot from this one passage right here that Matthew takes pause in his account of the Gospels to talk about King Jesus, and he talks about the wise men, and they're not talked about in Luke, Mark, or John. Some have, have su suggested, and I, I would tend to fall on this, that these wise men began their learning and were influenced by Daniel. And that Daniel's prophecy and teachings influenced them, and then from that, they begin to study, and for over 400 years, all right, they studied the scripture, watched the skies, and then when they saw his star in the east, they got up and, and moved on. We talked this morning about their journey in two years and the money that they spent. But I want to look at this, this tonight. I want to say this tonight, that they were dedicated in their wandering. They were dedicated in their wandering. Pastor Olette preaches a tremendous message. He says, follow the star. How many have ever had the privilege of hearing that message before? Raise your hand if you heard that, follow the star. If not, look it up. It is worth listening to. There's no doubt in my mind that Mrs. Alette wrote it. All right, it's that good. It is a great... I remember when I first heard this message, I think he just preached it. I was a sophomore in college. I was home on Christmas break. He preached that message, follow the star. The idea in that, and we'll talk about that some tonight because it was so influential, that idea. I had actually heard that concept like two weeks earlier at college. And the idea is, and you'll see this in the, in the scripture, that the wise men saw this, this thing in the sky. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And whatever it was convinced them to pack up their bags, jump on the camels, put the camels in drive, and go. And then it disappeared. And it was gone. Which is why they showed up at Jerusalem. For probably close to two years, there's no more star. In this message, he'll, he'll talk about how you follow the star even when the star disappears. When I look at the wise men, I see that they were dedicated and devoted in their wandering. The Bible tells us in verse number 2 in Matthew chapter 2 that the wise men said this. They said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen, what's the next two words? His star. Right, his star. They did not say we have seen a star. We have not seen the star. We have seen his star. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his, that Messiah, the king of the Jews. All right, there's a star. And this morning I shared, and, and later on, you flip to Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. That's where the star prophecy is given. That's what they looked at and believed in. All right, Numbers 24, I think it's 24, 17. Um, just double, yeah, 24, 17. And it says this, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. So they saw this, this thing. There was much um, uh, idea about what this star was. Now you'll see on, on, uh, on a lot of Christmas graphics, you'll see this huge bright star. It's beautiful, right? And it's popped right over the manger. You've seen that before? Yeah, we have two stars in the back. They're over a tree in the back, okay? And see, people put a star in their house. And, and the, uh, the question is, what was this thing in the sky? Now, I'm not an expert. I talked to, to Brother Kemp. Brother Kemp is a star guy. And to call him a star guy is to undersell what, what he has done and what he has seen. He has been even in charge of some things in, in Genesee County and, and beyond that. And no stars um, like some of you know how to work on a car. All right? And, and I asked him some thoughts. And because, because there's some things about the passage about this particular star that, that, caught, that catches your attention. Number one, it's that it appears and disappears, okay? And that if it was a star, they could have, what, tracked back the skies, correct? If it had been a star, we could have tracked it back because the, scar, the skies travel in a particular order. And if it was an, a natural occurrence, we could go back thousands of years and say, oh, well, this, these stars lined up. But apparently nothing lines up back then, correct? 
Right? There's no particular man or, or, or in the heavens a star. Yet the wise men say, we have seen his star. Well, then later on, when it comes back, it, it travels before them. Okay? And Jerusalem, they're at Jerusalem, is north of Bethlehem. Okay? So stars don't travel north to south or south or they don't travel south, they travel east to west, correct? Am I correcting that still? Okay, good, I, I'm a good student. East to west. So not only can we not find any record of this star appearing, we, we notice that this star doesn't travel a normal way that a natural star travels. There are some that say, well, it was the planet Venus, and it lined up exactly right, and, and they could, Venus because it's the, the morning light and the morning and the day star, which Christ is referenced as the day star in Second Peter. I don't believe it was Venus. I, I believe it was a very unique Light in the heavens. There's one scholar that said this light. All right, and he said, we have reference for seeing light before. He said, you look at Paul on the road to Damascus, and he was stopped by a bright light. And he knew, it, well, he knew that it was Jesus. All right? Whatever, these, whatever this thing was, someone else supposed that it was a pillar of fire. Because God appears as a pillar of fire to the children of Israel. And this word could have that connotation as well. I was studying that and I read that and I had to stop and just say, Lord, thank you. For whatever you did, whatever this is, and I can't wait to find out what it was. But whatever it was, when it showed up, these wise men were like, whoa, that is the star for the scepter of Jacob. That is, for the king of the Jews, this is not just a star. This is not just a planet. This is not just happening where the, the stars line up and the north star is a little brighter. No, no. This is the prophecy. This is what we study. This is what we knew. This is what we believe in. And it's time to go. And it was so clear to them. I look at this account with the wise men, and I see them jumping on there and going, and I see this, this wandering. It was personal. We'd seen his star was not confused with anything else. It was not a star. It was his star. As it was partial, it was disappeared. But, but then I see this. It was provided for because after it disappeared, we go back down to verse number 10. If you look there with me, it says, And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. You know why I love this part of the story and why I love that message pastor preached and our Lord's touched my heart about this concept, is there are so many times in life that God makes something very plain to you and to me. I mean very plain. Let me give you some examples of what can be very plain, all right? Children, obey your parents and Lord for this is right. Now that's pretty plain, is it not? Y yes or no? Come on, is that plain? All right, is that the only plain verse in Scripture? No, no, there are other ones that are maybe prophecies or, or things that, that maybe the Lord will view, reveal to us later on, but there's a lot of plain things in Scripture. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. So if I want to please the Lord, I must have faith. And that's, that's pretty plain, is it not? And there are so many times in life that God will show us something very plainly. But after He shows us, He seems sometimes to to take away the star, to block the light. Remember when I came here to First Baptist Church, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. Sitting on my bed, I opened up my Bible, turned to Jeremiah chapter 1, and to this day when I read Jeremiah chapter 1, it takes me back to that day, sitting on my bed. And I was praying, Lord, help me to know I'm supposed to come here to First Baptist Church. I read Jeremiah chapter 1, and it was as loud as if it were audible, though it was not audible. The Lord used a couple of verses in Jeremiah chapter 1 to say, J.D., you're supposed to be a First Baptist church. It was plain. It was clear. I closed my Bible. I was going to my meeting with Pastor Let a few minutes later, got in, my, uh, in that little Datsun that, that my parents let me drive and drove here to church and said, I'm coming to First Baptist church if you have me. It was plain. It was clear. There are times that God makes it very plain and very clear, but then the sky gets dark. The wise men were wandering in this darkness, and I believe we've all, if you've ever followed the Lord at all, you've all faced this at times. And in those times of wandering, it is so easy, and we've seen it before, Christians who get off track, 
We're like, Lord, you, you took the star away, so you must be telling me to go over here. You must be telling me to go over here. Lord, you must be telling me to go this way. And in fact, the Lord said, I gave you the clearness. I gave you the direction. Just follow the star. Just keep on keeping on. Can I make it kind of plain for you? It's like this, all right? You know, uh, about 14 years ago, I stood in this auditorium and said, I do with my wife. That was clear direction, right? So what should I keep on doing? I should keep on keeping on, right? Yes or no? 32 years ago when I said I do to the Lord, I got saved. I should keep on keeping on. What does that look like? One step at a time. What did, the, what did the wise men's journey look like? You know what? They got up the next morning, they got back on their camel, and they kept on going where they saw that they knew where the star was supposed to be. They kept on going. And that day was a long day, and maybe it rained that day, maybe it was a sandstorm that day. They, they, that night, and they got off their camels and, and bedded them down and, and got up the next day, and they took the next step. And sometimes for us as Christians, it's just getting up the next day and pleasing God tomorrow. You go to work and you say, Lord, maybe, help me be a good testimony this morning. Lord, help my mouth to honor you and my coworkers. Lord, I've got a friend. He's not saved. I want, I want him to have the gospel. Lord, would you open that door today? Lord, I'm getting home tonight, and we got some burns in our house. Lord, help us to have a house that pleases you. I'm praying for my son or my daughter or praying for my neighbor or praying for my grandmother or grandpa. Lord, help me today to stay faithful. That's following the star, step by step, just taking that next step, taking the next step, and you keep on keeping on. That's what the wise men did. Their reaction to the birth of Christ, you know what? They were dedicated in their wandering. wonder if they encountered some people along the way in those two years. Hey, where, where are you gentlemen going? Oh, we, we saw his star. We're going to worship him. Well, didn't you see it? One year, 364 days ago. Oh, you guys are nuts. You saw it that long ago, huh? And you're still going? Yeah, we're still going. We're still going. You see, I wonder if, if someone said, come on, can't we just turn around? Are, are you sure it was his star? Could you, guy, could you have gotten confused a little bit? Could it, could it have been a planet, perhaps? No, it wasn't a planet. It was his star. We saw and we know what, what we, we saw. We believe what we saw. We know the scripture we're going to follow by faith. There will be people around in your life, and it may come from inside, it may come from outside, They say, listen, are you sure about what you're doing? Are you sure you should follow God? Are you sure that's how you should raise your family? Are you sure that's the job you should take? And you're going there just for a church, and you say, you know what? It's what I got to do. I got to follow the star. See, I was sitting there a few weeks before that, and someone had said, never doubt in the dark was God, what God has taught you in the light. That same concept. It's so one of the principles that in my life has helped guide me. I've prayed this way multiple times, Lord, I'm not real smart, but I don't want to miss what you have. Would you make it plain for me? And Lord, until you make it plain, I'm going to keep on trying to keep on with, with your help. I prayed that way here at First Baptist Church. I said, Lord, I'm a youth pastor, and, and I'd heard in college that 18 months was the, the normal time for a youth pastor to be to church. And I, when I got here, I sit, sit in that office over there where Pastor Dylan is now. I said, Lord, help me to be here longer than 18 months. <laughs> yeah, boy, now you're stuck with me. He, he answered that. That's too bad. But the Lord made it plain. I knew when I was supposed to be uh, principal. I said, how'd you know, Brother Howell? Well, Pastor Lett came in my office and goes, hey, um, how about, why would you pray about being principal for a year? For a year. <laughs> yeah, a year. It's a long year. Pastor, I can't tell time real well. Now, 13 years later, the Lord has made it plain. Was it ever confusing? Sure, absolutely. Was I ever not sure? Sure. But you look at people. You look at Christians. They get excited, they get saved, and they make a decision for the Lord, and, and then life gets a little bit tough. If you're not careful, what happens? You say, oh, man, I think I missed it. Can I submit something to you? The, the wise men were dedicated. Follow that star. The Bible, the Lord, are better than any GPS system ever made. I saw this the other day that a lady was following her GPS. It, turned, it said to, for her to turn on the railroad tracks, so she did. I saw the picture. She's turned on these railroad tracks. I think it was last week. 
And uh, they came and they, they cited her for, for a reckless driving or something like that and had to tow her car. She was stuck. Now listen, you look at that lady, man, what an idiot. But, I mean, how many of us have used GPS and, and thought, well, it doesn't look right, but it says to turn there. You know, down this side street and, and oh, it looks like a river, but must go across the river and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. I wish we would follow God as faithfully as we follow Google Maps and Apple Maps. When Apple Maps first hit the market, a lady ended up in the desert because that's where Apple Maps told her to go. And we have Christians who can't follow clear teaching tells us to go. Follow the star. Follow the star when the way gets dark. Follow the star. You don't know where you'll end up. No one has ever got lost following the star. No one's ever got misguided by following the star. Listen, if you get off track and you're misled, it's not God's fault. He has not misled you. You may make a wrong turn. I may make a wrong turn, but, but God didn't tell us to make a wrong turn. And there's some times in what you're saved for a few years, you realize that you, what you thought was a misstep, what you thought was a wrong turn, was actually God's hand guiding in your life. You look back and you say, God, wow, you were doing this over here, and I didn't even see it coming. Thank you for what you're doing. Lord, help me just keep on following you. I see that they were dedicated and they're wandering. But I see one more action from the wise men. And that's they were devoted in their worship. Verse number two. First thing they say to Herod. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and we are come and are come to worship him. Verse number 11. When they were come into the house... They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. They fell down and worshipped him. I really enjoyed the study of this of the wise men, and this particular part of it kind of really touched my heart. I began to think how often, I was challenged by the thought, how often do we worship our Savior? I'm not talking about just coming to church, because you can come to church and sit here. I'm not just saying about praying before you eat and Lord bless this food, amen. But worship. Begin to think about this. I challenged earlier in this morning about how far would you drive to see the baby Jesus? What kind of gifts would you take? But I'd ask this question in, in this regard. What would your response be if you walk into a room and there is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? What would you do? Hey, Mary, how you feeling? Oh, that's Jesus. He's my friend. Would you be like the wise men who had no other response but to fall down and worship? No words would suffice. No, nothing, no requests were made that I see. Just worship saying, Lord, we're not worthy. Like I mentioned, probably over 400 years of wise men waiting for this moment. After this, they get back on their camels and go home another way, right? Being warned of God in a dream about Herod's plans. So they're for just... Just a slice of time. This whole journey, two years, one and a half to three years, all this money, all the burdens and the, and the sweat and the sand, and now they get there and they're here just for this little time with Jesus, the baby Jesus. And then they leave. But in that moment, they fall down and worship him. I began to think, and my heart meditated on that passage, those verses. I thought, what was it like on the ride home? You know, often a ride home is quicker than a ride to someplace. And I bet that ride home was a joyous ride home. When they got back to their homes, what do you think they talked about? 
I don't think you could get them to keep their mouths shut about this. What do you think their children heard about until these wise men, these wise men passed away? You know what they heard about? The time that they got to see the king of the Jews, the young child Jesus, and present gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And I don't think they ever grew weary of telling that story. I don't think they ever got tired of saying, and we walked into that room, and you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't believe it if I told you. You wouldn't believe it there. There was Mary. Remember Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. That was her right there. Right next to her was the king of the Jews. Daniel 7, 14 says, The son of man, the scepter of Jacob. And no doubt that their lives were changed because of their time worshiping Jesus. I would just ask you, when was the last time you worshiped Jesus? Not just sing, hark the herald angels sing. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Not just even open up your Bible, but because you can open up your Bible and, and not worship the Lord. You can read and just close it and be done and say, you know what, I read my Bible today and not met with your Savior. You can even pray and not worship. You can just say these things, but could we not get gripped with the same reverence that the wise men had in that room? And I tell you, it touched my heart. I see what they presented. They presented three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold symbolizes God, Jesus as king. I'll get it back up there so I can read these verses. Revelation, I think it's chapter 20, 19, verse 16. And he hath on his vesture, on his thigh, a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. As they presented the gold, I believe, they were symbolizing Jesus. You are the king. This young child, you are the king. And you're not only a king, you are the king. You're king of kings and Lord of lords. And we worship you. We bow before you. We submit to you. Though you may be young, we recognize who you are what you will do, and we are your servants. What a great response for us as Christians to have. Jesus, you are the king. You're king of kings and lord of lords. And Lord, we recognize you as king, and not only king of the world, but king of my life. Lord, if you tell me what to do and you make a plan, I'll do it. Lord, you tell me to quit my job, I'll quit it. You tell me where to go, you tell me what to do. Lord, you're the king. They presented gold in worship. They presented frankincense. It's a tree it's cut, and like a maple tree, out of it flows a gum-like substance. It's used as incense in worship. Leviticus 2, verses 1 and 2 said, And when any will offer a meat offering unto the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour, and he shall pour oil upon it and put frankincense thereon. And he shall bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests, and he shall take there, there out his handful of the flour thereof and the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof. The priest shall burn the memorial of it upon the altar to be an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. John 4, 23 and 24 says this, But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. They present myrrh, Bitterness, embalming the dead it would be used for, in his, I think symbolized Christ's sacrifice. You may remember this in Mark chapter 15, verse 23, and they gave him, that's Jesus, to drink wine mingled with myrrh. But he received it not. We can confuse worship in our current Christian culture with a dark auditorium. They'll say, come to worship service, and they'll, or maybe call it, a, call it a flashlight church. We need a flashlight to get to your pew. They say, we're going to worship, and we'll turn off all the lights and worship, and we most definitely can worship in the dark or in the light, either way. You can confuse worship with sometimes emotional music. In the worship, we must have the, the exact right kind of music, and no doubt that music is and ought to be a part of worship. If you don't believe that, just read the book of Psalms. 
You find out about music, and it's impassioned music. It is, it is not just a dead music. It is, a, it is a, an emotional music. You read David, and you're like, wow, this man was, was moved by his God. And sometimes we equate worship with a feeling in our heart. You know, I just knew I worshiped God. Well, how did you know you worship God? Well, boy, you should have just, you know, I, I felt it right here. And no doubt... No doubt, when you worship God in spirit and in truth, our hearts will be touched. Can I just submit to you that 2018, that God is still looking, seeking those to worship Him? And when I look at the, 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 the birth of Jesus Christ, and I see the wise men and I see Him fall down on their face, and they worship. Maybe tears were shed. Maybe prayers offered, but they worshiped. And God saw that. He made note of that, that they worshiped. These are his words. It would be great in 2018 if, once again, because of the birth of Christ, there were some wise men and wise women who worshiped Jesus Christ, who take time, not just this season, but during this season, to get along with God to get a hold of God, to let God get a hold of you. Say, God, I want to be moved. I don't want to be changed. Lord, I want to hear from you. I want your book to be alive in my heart. Lord, I want the faith that will please you evident in my life. Lord, I want a love that, that my kids can see, that my coworkers can see, that my wife or my husband can see. Lord, that my grandfather or that my grandchild can see, but Lord, I want to be a true worshiper of you. I look at the wise men, I'm challenged by their worship. So I wonder tonight where you're at. If you're on that journey following the star, if you're lost in worship, I've been challenged by the wise men myself. And as I look at what they did, so you know what? It's not a bad reaction to the birth of Jesus Christ. It's a little more than a few Christmas carols and a few lights and reading the Christmas story on Christmas morning. It's about looking at our Savior, seeing what He did, what He wants to do, and following Him. Lord, I thank You for Your Word. It challenges and changes us, Lord. Lord, I pray and ask that as we meditate and contemplate on the birth of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, we have the full truth. We know exactly what happened and took place. Lord, sometimes we're so shallow in our thoughts about you. Oh, Lord, would you touch us? May our hearts be warmed in the light of your word. Lord, may we follow you even when the way grows dark. Lord, would we worship you with the reverence and obeisance that the wise men had.